Hello, everyone. We're giving uh, uh, everyone a few seconds to join from the waiting room, and then we will start the webinar. Welcome everyone, this is Sabrina Paganoni. I'm speaking from uh, the Healy Center for ALS, Healy and MG Center for ALS and Mass General. Uh, and tonight uh, we're gonna provide uh, our weekly Healy ALS platform trial. And I'm very excited to, um, to be here with many of my colleagues, Dr. Sukovic and our patient navigation team, Catherine Small and Alison Bulat. So if you can go to the next slide. For tonight, I really want to give the, uh, Mike to Catherine to start uh, because we want to share with you all the materials and, uh, and, and really tools that Catherine and Alison have been working on for the last couple of years. And I think they may be of great interest to many of you. Catherine? Thanks, Sabrina. So these slides are actually some slides that we're recycling from a in-person meeting that uh, Platform Trial Research Centers had recently in Boston. Um, and because you all are such a big part of this conversation and part of building um, partnership in ALS research, we're bringing those slides over to you now. And um, I think it's actually come up previously on one of these webinars that somebody had asked, you know, if we keep track of the webinar views and the attendance, and we do, um, it's not a perfect science, but we manually have been keeping track. And um, so the, the data that we collected since October 2020 up until March 2023, um, we hosted, at this point, over 115 public Q&A webinars like this one. Um, we've had over 50 guest speakers featured, and now today that, I guess, includes me. Um, and on a weekly average, we get about 70 people who tune in, um, more if, if we have, you know, kind of a attractive special topic for the week, maybe some fewer people during the summer for sure. Um, but thousands of views of the recordings that we post on YouTube. And by far the most popular webinars that we offer as a sub-series are the drug science Q&A webinars. And those are the ones that we host. Anytime we add a new regimen, we ask representatives from the drug companies to come on and talk about the science. Um, so most recently we hosted one about regimen F. We're in, you know, planning to host one for upcoming regimen G. Um, and so, you know, that's a popular resource that we'll keep going, but um, me working as the patient navigator behind the scenes. Um, when people have emails or phone calls with questions about the trial, um, since I started in this role, we've answered over 2,600 questions um, from the community. And, you know, there's always something new happening. So we're always here to answer future questions as well. So we can head on to the next slide. Um, and this trial, I'm not sure if anybody attending this particular webinar is tuning in from a different country, but we definitely have been in touch with people from lots of different places throughout the world, which is great. It's great to see that the ALS community and research community are so well connected like this. Um, and I have personally been in touch with families living in 39 different countries. So that's been really remarkable, especially, you know, amidst the pandemic. Um, one of the stories that I brought up at the meeting was talking to the family in Belgium. You know, I'm sitting remotely in my little work office at home, talking to a family across the ocean about research and, and the hope of the platform trial and all that that brings. So, um, you know, we're glad that through these webinars and through patient navigation, we're able to stay connected and part of the conversation here together. And I think there's one more slide for me, maybe two. Yep, there's two more. So this slide here, I wanted to give an example of um, you know, one of the things as patient navigator that Alice and I do is work really closely with sites to help support them. Um, we have 72, I think up to 74 now this year, sites that we're working with throughout the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of study staff to support to help with communications. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do to kind of help out is to introduce this online eligibility checking tool. And this is, you know, public resource that's available on our website. Um, and it allows anybody, whether, you know, you're a family member filling it out on behalf of a loved one or, um, you know, if you're just answering these questions on, you know, from your own perspective, it's a really simple anonymous survey, five yes or no questions, and it helps figure out whether the platform trial might be a good fit or, you know, based on some of the key eligibility criteria, if a different avenue is worth pursuing, you know, maybe expanded access opportunities would be more appropriate. Um, we launched this tool back in May 2021. And since then, 650 um, survey responses have been submitted. 
Um, and when I looked at the data, I was kind of pleasantly surprised that over 70% of people who filled out the survey were deemed potentially eligible for the platform trial. And I think that really speaks to um, the design of this trial where the criteria were built to be broader than other clinical trials to date, to be more inclusive and expand access to clinical research for more people. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a silver lining that we were able to see through the data from this tool. And then on the next slide, um, just wanted to put, we always share this week to week and I'll put it in the chat as well, but this is my contact information. So if you send an email to that email, if you leave a message at that phone number, um, you know, probably nine times out of 10, it's me on the other line or, you know, Allison or Judy help cover when I'm out of the office. Um, and I do work closely with Allison Bula and Judy Carey on a regular basis. Judy was actually featured as a guest speaker a couple weeks ago. Um, so if you wanted to look at the recording to learn more about Judy's role within our department, um, you can check out our webpage as well. But I think that's about a wrap for my little featurette here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, to share again that we are enrolling uh, for the platform trial. So really we have hundreds of spots available for people with ALS who are interested in enrolling in the trial. Right now we are enrolling for Regimen F uh, and very soon we will start enrolling for Regimen G. And if we can go to the next slide, um, I want to share that we are working right now for Regimen F uh, across 48 sites, but we are expanding the list of sites again, and we expect many more sites to become active soon. And also very soon, we will have to show also a tracker for Regimen G. Uh, the, the idea here is that uh, hopefully all of these sites will be open for both very soon. So again, there is a little bit kind of, you know, catching up, but I, I expect that the majority of sites will be up and running for both F and G very soon. Again, bringing hundreds of research spots uh, to people across the country. Um, so thank you for, uh, for all your work and for connecting with your sites. Again, Catherine is available even outside of this webinar. And thank you for putting your contact information in the chat right now. Uh, you can always um, either you know, watch these recordings if you uh, don't have time to, to sort of write down her contact information or even download the slides. And thank you also, Catherine, for preparing all these wonderful QR codes. Uh, one day you'll teach me how to make them, but essentially uh, we have QR codes for pretty much every page on our website. And so you can quickly go to the relevant page, um, depending on the information you're looking for. Next slide. For example, if you're wondering whether the site next to you uh, in your town um, is active on Regimen F or not, uh, you can use the QR code that you can see right now or use the link on our website and it will show if the site is recruiting or not. I do want to point out that uh, all the sites that are listed are active in, in some way, shape or form in, in the platform trial. Many of them are still following participants uh, from previous regimens. So not recruiting doesn't mean that they're not active, quite the contrary, they're very actively following participants from previous regimens and they're working on activating their site for F and then for G. So, so again, all sites are, are very much engaged and we hope to have all of them turn to recruiting mode for both F and G very soon. Next slide. And another uh, really um, uh, feature of, uh, of the, the work that uh, Catherine does and with Alison and, and Judy um, on a daily basis is really to try to develop resources that can be helpful to people with ALS. And so you can find these wonderful brochures on our website. Um, and again, you can use the QR code or the link. Next slide. And uh, as Catherine was mentioning, our most popular web webinars are when we bring in researchers uh, from companies and, and other um, labs that explain the science behind the drugs that we are including in the platform trial. So uh, recently we hosted this uh, drug science and mechanism of action webinar for Regimen F, which is testing a drug developed by Calico Labs in partnership with AVI. And you can definitely uh, watch the recording on our website. We're working on scheduling Regimen G uh, so that we will we will have a similar webinar essentially for Regiment G with the scientists from Denali that will soon come um, on our um, Thursday webinar to talk about their drug. Next slide. 
last but not least, we have another webinar to share with you. That's the recording of a webinar that Dr. Maragakis, who was also a guest speaker on this webinar, did recently to explain the importance of biomarkers and why it's so important, especially for the new regimens, to, to, to engage in really biomarker research. And specifically, uh, we are collecting um, spinal fluid by way of doing um, lumbar punctures uh, in uh, to collect the really uh, these important biomarkers that are essentially brand new and many of them are really uh, important recent developments uh, in the field of ALS and so we really think it's uh, it's really critical that we do this type of research as we do regimen F and G because that will allow us to really validate these biomarkers and all of you know uh, how important biomarkers are in ALS research they also were very helpful in um, in drug approvals recently so this is another way uh, for us to really learn more about ALS science and, and really bring drug development to the next level with these um, powerful biomarkers. Next slide. And our last slide, um, you know, again, uh, feel free to contact us anytime. Uh, we have a number of upcoming webinars listed and uh, next week, in addition to our um, regular webinar, I would like to talk briefly about an overview of the FDA approved medications for ALS. Again, we, we heard from patients that they also want to kind of hear sort of a summary or a recap of recent events. And so I'm happy to provide that. Um, and then the following week, I also uh, would like to provide an overview of the platform trial progress to date. Many people have asked us, so, uh, you know, in addition to these weekly updates, can you tell us, you know, a summary of what you have uh, you have found so far? And I'm happy to do so. Um, and, and that's because really people obviously are joining um, uh, different times. You know, some of you I know from the names that you've been following us uh, since the very beginning when, um, when Sandy Morris and others asked us to do this weekly webinar, uh, our patient advisors. And so you, many of you have been very faithful and, and been following uh, this, this webinar. So thank you for that. But there's also new people who may want to hear uh, a summary about uh, what we've done so far in case you started joining us later. So thank you for that. And we'll be sure to provide the content um, that you requested over the next few webinars. So thank you so much. And I think we can start taking the slides, uh, the questions. Uh, so questions. Uh, thank you so much for um, the nice comments uh, that, you know, Catherine is a really a, a five-star uh, <laughs> speaker and, and a team um, member. So thank you so much. Uh, a few questions. When do we expect expanded access to start for regimens F and G? So thank you for that. We really would love to open these expanded access programs for pretty much every drug uh, that's in the platform trial. We are having those conversations with the drug companies. Uh, and as soon as we get their trials up and running, we will continue to have those you know, conversations. They want to get some more data uh, from the first participants. Oftentimes, this is something that many companies do. They want to uh, get to the first uh, sort of safety check. Uh, we, we do that regularly. Uh, and then, um, then after that, open up for expanded access. So hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. So great question about the acronym um so uh it's the um the the question if i understand the question correctly the question is about uh the regimen g the denali regimen uh also known as um again regimen g or the Healy ls platform trial so i think that the question let me know if i'm not understanding the, the question correctly but i think uh you're also wondering uh why it's posted on city.gov and not posted on our website, if I understand the question correctly. I think, uh, again, it's it's posted on city.gov as an upcoming trial. Um, and then we will post on uh, sort of, you know, uh, activation at the sites uh, over the next few days. I don't know, Merit, if you have anything or to add to that. Yeah, I, I'm wondering also, they have an ongoing phase 1B. Oh. That's probably, probably posted. Um, but uh, we uh, we are getting ready to activate, so uh, we'll be listing the sites as soon as they're ready on, on the on the website too. And actually, since I have you on, there's a question about mascitinib. Uh, the question is, if, uh, if it gets approved in Europe and Canada, what do we think uh, is the consequence? I guess in 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 the US, do you think the FDA will be able to approve it? Oh, I, I don't think we've seen any. Uh, you know, they have an ongoing trial right now. So I think the FDA would want to see that trial result first. Um, I, and I, I, I don't know, if, I mean, I find it unlikely to get approved in Canada or, or Europe based on the, 
the current trial that's been published. I think they're, everyone's going to wait for the current phase three trial. Yeah. I could be there's, wrong, but that's what I would think. There's a couple of questions about the number of people enrolled in Regimen F. Uh, I apologize, I don't think we had that on the slides today, uh, and we'll definitely get, get the number for you next week. I don't remember exactly, but you know, uh, certainly enrollment is going quite well. Uh, we have a few, maybe over 20 people, but again, I'll have to check the exact number. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's been a lot of interest, which is really great. I um, you know, when we start, we ask the sites to um, enroll two people first, and not, not to enroll like 10 people at a time, you know, just to start with two. And we make sure that everything's going well with the drug supply and the visits. And then once, um, once, and that, that's typical for all trials. You just want to make sure that sites are doing it well and it's going well at a site. And then you say, you can enroll as many people as interested in your site. So I think um, many, of, many of our first sites are now past the first two people and enrolling openly, but some of the newer sites are still just doing two people um, and then they'll, they'll um, pick up. So I think we'll see like June and July, a uh, huge enrollment. But as far as that, last time I saw there were over 40 people who have um, oh, entered entered at the master screening. Um, so it's, it's um, yeah, I'm very excited about it. I think the science is fantastic and uh, it's oral. So it's a easy, easier drug to take than, than some of the other ones. So um, yeah, there's a good question about the phase of development. So on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you know, our regimens and our trial shows up as a phase two slash three trial. So the question is, is this more a phase two um, trial or, or what? And then the, uh, the question is also, when are we going to see the results of the phase one trial of regimen F? Do, do you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, you know, I, I personally don't like the phase two, phase three. I, I kind of like to think of it, you're either looking at efficacy or you're um, exploring doses at the earlier phase. And so this is in the later phase, um, um, but you know, it, it's still a tradition. So I kind of, um, I tend to just say, this is the efficacy you know, study. Um, we'd have to ask Calico. I mean, they're still in the middle of, uh, the, of the phase one. I mean, they have enough of the data to have picked the doses for this study and the safety, but they, um, as far as I know, it's still blind and they haven't looked at any of the efficacy, but it's a very small, um, phase one. So I, I, I don't think they're going to be able to do more than safety biomarkers, dose spine B. Same for um, regimen G. Yeah. And thank you. Somebody uh, wrote some follow-up questions about the registration on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I see that you're saying um, the Denali regimen is already showing up as a regimen, but not as part of the, the, the parent protocol. So I'll check on that. Sometimes, you know, city.gov has a cycle. Essentially, we submit uh, things and then it may get updated. So I'll check on that. And, and hopefully by next week, it will be all done. Um, question about what do you have to do to be eligible for expanded access? So, um, so I'm happy to kind of summarize that, uh, that we're really trying to look for, it's two different populations, the ones that can enroll in the clinical trial and the EAP or expanded access uh, target population. So EAPs in alignment with uh, FDA guidance uh, are really designed for people who are not eligible for clinical trials. So essentially uh, there's a set of criteria for being eligible for the platform trial or for other randomized controlled trials. And then uh, EAPs are for people who are not eligible for trials. So uh, the exact criteria again may depend a little bit program by program, but that's the overall idea. So good question about um, uh, the kind of, you know, is for somebody who enrolls in regimen F or G, uh, the question about, you know, that the, there is an, an initial placebo controlled portion of the trial followed by an active treatment extension. And so the question is, do participants um, know at the end of the placebo control portion if they were on active or placebo before deciding to go on the active treatment extension? And, and so Dr. Skovic, do you want to take that? I'm sure. Um, no, um, um, we can't tell people that. And actually we don't know it either. Um, and that's really coming from the FDA and, and is really important because uh, that way we can also use the data from the um, active treatment extension or what we're calling ATE that used to be called OLE. Uh, we can learn from there about um, the effects of the drug. So we'll be comparing people who start the drug six months later than somebody who started in the double blind. And we saw from two FDA approvals, uh, the Relivrio and the Tofersen that just got approved 
how critical that um, open label extension that period was to those approvals. And if, if that had been unblinded before that, none of that data would have been able to be used and we wouldn't have those two drugs approved. So the FDA makes it very clear where we have to maintain the blind. Um, it's not. So I, I realize it makes it harder for people to decide, but um, I think the science is as good, um, you know, when someone's out there, you know, six months later as it was when you're thinking about the trial. And of course, we'll, we'll know more about the safety by then. And, and that'll be a good discussion with your, you know, your neurologist about whether the best thing for you is to continue in the um, open label part or to, to do something else. Um, but we learn a lot from the that um, active treatment extension of that open label part. Yeah. So question about how to determine if somebody is eligible for a clinical trial or not. Uh, and I know um, the, the person who asked us uh, referred to the uh, screening tool just shared by Catherine. So I want to, to confirm that that's sort of a first pass uh, publicly available tool for anywhere, anyone, anywhere really to check the main criteria. Now we do need uh, interested uh, participants to uh, to go actually meet with their clinical team and research team to do a full eligibility. So what we can share on the website is sort of, you know, the main characteristics, but then there are other things. For example, we need to check safety labs or uh, chem black chemistries, black counts, and those can only be done by essentially meeting with the research team and confirming that all the laboratory evaluations are okay. So again, uh, definitely uh, please feel free to use the self-assessment tool uh, to, to look for the main clinical characteristics that you can evaluate yourself. But then again, we do need to have some um, actual um, procedures uh, such as um, blood chemistries uh, and blood counts to be tested on site. Question about the dose strength and dose frequency data for the uh, regimen G. Again, we will have a webinar to explain all of this, but it's a simple daily administration. So uh, pretty easy to take um, and uh, people need to be able to swallow at the beginning of the trial, but it's also a, an oral drug that potentially can be used by a feeding tube or given by a feeding tube if people lose the ability to swallow during the trial. So pretty straightforward. There's a question about uh, in general, uh, companies or regimens like Regimen F, they already have a phase one trial um, um, that's still ongoing. Uh, why did they start a phase two slash three trial before the completion of the phase one trial? Dr. Sokovic, do you want to take that? You know, I, I think these companies are listening to people with ALS who are saying that time is valuable um, and working on the ALS clock. So they're they're starting the phase two, three when they have enough data for that. And that is data on biomarkers and safety and dosing. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't more information they can collect longer term from the people in the phase one B, but they, um, they're moving faster, which I, I think is fantastic. Yeah. Question about a specific product, NU9, uh, that was recently featured in a webinar from Everything ALS. So the question is, is NU9 going to be in the platform trial? I hope so. Now, I do have a conflict that just signed up to be on their uh, science advisory board. So I'll just say that. But um, we would we would love them to when, when they're at that stage. Now, they're, they're, they still need to do their first in human uh, study. Um, uh, and then, um, and then, so they're, they're still a ways away from being ready for uh, uh, this platform trial. Question about the mechanism of action of regimens F and G. They, they target the same um, mechanism. So the question is, why are we testing two drugs that target the same mechanism? So, yeah, I can answer that. I mean, when we first started the platform trial, when we first made a competition to be the first four drugs in it, we, we made a specific point to pick four drugs that had different, different biologies. But um, after that, we decided that we would take any company uh, with the drug that had great science. And um, when these two came up uh, independently, we decided that they were gonna do the studies anyhow. And if they were gonna do it without the platform trial, it was gonna take you know, three times more people and much more time. And the most efficient way was actually in the platform trial. Uh, now they, you know, uh, when Denali comes on, we can ask them more questions about their their drug, and, and they're not exactly identical, but it's a, it's a similar mechanism of action. 
Excellent. So the last question I see is um, in terms of eligibility, when determining eligibility for the platform trial, do we take into account the rate of change on the ALS functional rating scale or ALS FRSR? Uh, and the answer is no. So we don't have a criterion for eligibility uh, that's based on a number on the ALS FRSR. I know other trials use that. Yeah, we don't, but when we do the analysis, we take into uh, account, um, right. you know, the rate of change before in those numbers, but not as an uh, inclusionary exclusion right. criteria. I think last question that came in, um, how far is the next regimen after F and G? In other words, when are we going to have a regimen H in the platform trial? We're very excited that we've actually signed a design contract with a with the company for Regiment H. Um, so I, I I don't have a timeline yet of either when they'll be ready to join or when we'll be able to announce uh, uh, which company it is. Um, for some companies, the design phase can be very short, and other ones it can be a, a little longer. So we 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 uh, but we have we do have an H, so that's exciting. And we have a lot of other companies we're talking about. Um, I think people have really seen that this is a a good way to to test um, drugs, and it's um, again very patient centered and very and efficient. Excellent. I, I think we took all the questions for today. So it's always great questions and great to connect. And we'll definitely be here next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.